I'm looking forward to sharing with you this morning. I have to be very honest, full disclosure. You know that I do like to be honest. Um, I have had a busy couple of weeks, couple of months, years, really, <laughs> and, and did all the work, I promise, of exegesis, of really considering the scripture for today, understanding its context, really sitting with the application, praying into it, but I ran out of some creative steam when it came to the introduction. <laughs> and they say that a good sermon is all about the hook. You've got to hook people in fast. And so I did what all of us are now doing when we run out of creative steam. I asked ChatGPT. <laughs> and so the chatbot has kindly provided an introduction for us this morning. It's good morning or afternoon, everyone. It's such an honor for me to be here today. I'm excited to talk to you, although I'll admit I was a little nervous at first. I mean, public speaking. What a workout, right? You start with a little anxiety, and by the end, you're either sweating, out of breath, or feeling proud of yourself for surviving. But seriously, I'm thrilled to have the chance to speak with you all. I promise to keep it uplifting, unless, of course, I run out of coffee before I finish, <laughs> in which case all bets are off. Anyway, let's dive in. I hope to share something today that will make you smile, think, and maybe even give you a reason to stay awake. Yeah. Is it, is it good, Pastor Rob? I don't know. I was like, I think you can do better than that, actually. I think that doesn't sound like me. I don't know what the deal is with coffee but that doesn't sound like me, I think I'm funnier. So I said to the chatbot, make it funny. And so, good morning or afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Honestly, I was a little nervous, mainly because I thought, what if I forget everything I'm supposed to say? But then I remembered, I'm here to talk about something I really care about. So if I forget, I'll just make it up and act like I was meant to do that. I also thought about wearing a suit for this, because of course the chatbot thinks that everybody's a man. I thought about wearing a suit for this, but then I remembered that the last time I wore a suit, I was trying to oppress my dog with how professional I looked. I know. And I'm pretty sure he's still judging me from across the room. This is why you only use the chatbot when the stakes are low, can I just say, not when stakes are high. Anyway, I promise that I'm not here to make you fall asleep Unless, of course, I go overboard with inspirational quotes, and then I can't be held responsible. So let's dive in and make this as fun as possible. Ready? Let's get started before I lose you to the coffee break. Also not great. I thought, one last try. <laughs> one last try. Maybe it's because it doesn't understand that we're Christians. And so I said to the chatbot, make it more Christian. And it said, good afternoon or morning, everyone. I'm so glad to be here today. Honestly, when I was asked to speak, I said, sure, I'd love to, mainly because I thought I'd get to stand up and hear some, some amazing wisdom. But then I realized I'd have to live up to it. So I started praying hard, saying, Lord, give me the words and maybe some extra coffee. I didn't, I didn't ask, I didn't, coffee was not part of the information I gave. Um, I did think about starting with the Bible verse, but then I quickly remembered there's no verse 2.15 that says thou shalt be entertaining. So I decided to keep it real and hopefully keep you all awake. But seriously, I'm honored to be here and to speak to such a wonderful group of people. That's true. I promise not to take up too much of your time unless the Holy Spirit decides to take over and leads us into a full-on revival. <laughs> and if that happens, you're gonna to have to pray for me because I did not prepare a two-hour sermon. <laughs> so let's dive in. I'll keep it short and sweet, but I can't promise anything because you know, when the Lord speaks, we listen. <laughs> so thank you, chatbot, for that. I think I will take it from here. It was a good experiment. I don't think I'll use it again. There are some truths in there. You are a wonderful group of people. I am happy to be here. When the Lord speaks, we listen. And coffee is also very, very good. 
and very nice. So we're happy about that. Um, we are in November. Can you believe it? They say the year goes faster the older you are. And so, but I don't think it's because I'm old. I think it's because the year is going really fast. It feels like we just did Christmas. Where are the young people in the room? Is the year going fast for you? Sort of, yeah, because all the old people are like, yes, very fast, very fast. <clears throat> but it has flown by, and just, November's kind of that time in the year when we have an opportunity to, I don't know, you start to reflect on the year that's been, whatever it's been, whatever it's looked like, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you take time to think about it and consider it, and maybe if you can, make sense of it, or at least make peace with it. And then you start to think about, on the back of that, what does next year look like? What am I hoping for? What am I dreaming for? I'm a goal setter by nature, so I'm always looking ahead, going, what's next? What's next? Whether that's good or bad, it just is. And so this is a good time of year for us to start considering what's next. But regardless of, of what we hope for or dream about or, or are wanting to achieve next year, we don't really know what the year is going to hold for us. We don't know what plot twists there are going to be. We don't know what high highs there are going to be or low lows. But we know that we can do all of those things through Christ who gives us strength, right? And so I don't know how many of you were here when I shared the message on we, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Oh, good, okay, so well, not enough of you for me to not do the recap, so you're all going to hear the recap then. Um, and it was about six months ago, I, I shared on this verse, that, that is a famous verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we often use it in a really aspirational way and a triumphant way, but the way in which it was intended, the way in which Paul wrote it wasn't so much, you know, I can win Australian Idol through Christ who strengthens me. It was more, I can do difficult things. You know, I can live through tough stuff. Paul was in a difficult situation, and in that, the context of that passage, he says, you know, I have lived through good things. I've had time of abundance. I've had time of good, and I have time of need, and I've had times of difficulty and times of lack, and I can do all of those things through Christ who strengthens me. And it's the same for us. Life can be beautiful and wonderful and full of joy and full of, full of celebration, and, and good things. And life can also be brutal and difficult and challenging and hard. And we can do all of those things because Christ gives us strength. We can do all of those things because we are human. And so we are miraculously resilient. It is amazing what we can live through. What we, we can do things that we never thought are possible. We have a very high level of resilience as humans. We also have a very good God who is for us and not against us. And so we can push into him and we can rest in him and his peace and his goodness and his grace is sufficient for us. And because we're in this community, we exist within a community of people who love us and support us and cheer us on and hold space for us. And so because of those things, we can do all things through Christ. And Paul was sharing this message when he was going through a particularly difficult time. And it's really good that he had that mindset because he had a lot of hardships still to endure. Paul was not nearly done with the challenges that were awaiting him. And so today I thought I would pick up towards the end of Paul's journey and we would just look a little bit about what was happening for Paul at the end of his ministry and at the end of his life. And we're going to look at um, a, piece, a, a passage of scripture that's coming out of 2 Timothy, which was the final letter that Paul wrote. And so um, high-level context of what was happening when we look at 2 Timothy, we know that Paul wrote the letter. Um, he wrote it from prison, uh, what we think was the Marmitan prison, and that is a, it still exists. You can go and visit it in Rome. It's an archaeological site. Uh, and we believe he was probably there because that's where people went when they were undergoing, when they were going through trial or they were awaiting execution. And so it was a pretty awful place. Um, think dungeon. Uh, and he would have, you would, they would have gone down this ladder. They would have gone into this rocky sort of 
um, dungeon that had very little airflow that would have smelt awful, would have been cold and wet and disgusting and awful, and so pretty grim, and so that's where we find Paul. And he writes this letter to Timothy, who's a young leader, his protege. Um, and Timothy himself is going through a bit of a difficult time. Timothy is getting some opposition. He's leading the church in Ephesus under Paul's direction, um, the Ephesian church, and he's getting some opposition because he's young. Uh, we think maybe early 30s at this point. He started his ministry late teens, and so people are giving him a bit of a hard time, and he's getting some opposition because of his association with Paul. You know, we, when we read the works of Paul, when we think about the Paul, we have this love and deep admiration for him, but that's 21st century Christianity. First century Christianity, a little bit different. Paul had, there was a stigma attached to Paul. Um, he, was, he was always suffering. He was in jail a lot, and so people weren't all excited about that sort of Christianity, weirdly. Um, and so there was, there was a negative association. So so Timothy was getting a bit of a, a bit of um, flack against it about because of his relationship with Paul, and then the time in which this exists is probably one of the most severe times of persecution that you can imagine. So it's um, called the Reign of Terror under Emperor Nero, and so Nero was this infamous leader who was notorious for his persecution of Christians. He hated Christians. And he uh, was responsible for the worst, most humiliating, most horrific, most terrible executions of Christians. And so that is the context in which we find Paul writing this letter to Timothy. That's about as tough as it gets, right? Like that is hard going. Paul is in Struggle Street. Timothy's in Struggle Street. Christendom's in Struggle Street. And if we look a little bit deeper in terms of the context where how Paul finds himself in this place, and this is some of the context that I shared when I um, spoke earlier this year about the verse, I can do all things. How did Paul end up here? Well, Paul, we know, had, was Saul of Taurus, had this incredible conversion experience, um, very dramatic, phenomenal conversion experience. And in the second half of his life, he, he devoted to sharing the gospel. So going from city to city, planting churches, sharing the gospel. And when I say sharing the gospel, I'm talking about what the Hebrew calls a euangelion, you meaning good, angelion meaning announcement. And it had kind of royal undertones. So it was a royal proclamation. This good news that a new King Jesus with a new way of doing and a new way of being and a new way of living. And in this new way, love was at its core. And love was so powerful that it reached to the margins, that no one was excluded and no one was left behind. And because this love was so powerful, the hungry were fed and the homeless were welcome and there was space for everyone in this kingdom. That is the message that Paul was prepared to die for. And so he would go from city to city sharing this powerful message of the gospel. And he would tell everybody and anybody who would listen. So he would go to the synagogues and he would share the message until they kicked him out. And then he would go to the marketplaces where he would mend tents and make tents because that was his vocation, his profession. And he would do that so that he could you know, generate income to cover his travel expenses. And he would go into the markets and he would talk about this gospel, this incredible, powerful um, love under the reign of King Jesus. And that, of course, this message of love, this message of self-sacrifice, this message of a new ruler and a new reign and a new rule and way was at odds with the Roman political empire and the, and the Roman political order. And so it would cause some problems. It would incite some riots and violence and barneys and shenanigans, and there would be trouble, and Paul would be beaten, and Paul would be thrown in prison for causing trouble. And it is in this place that we find Paul, back in prison. So he wrote letters from prison. There was Philippians, uh, which is the letter that we talked about earlier this year, I Can Do All Things, uh, where we find that passage of Scripture. He, he wrote a letter to the, the church in Colossae, the Colossian, the Colossian church from prison. He wrote a letter to Philemon, um, to Ephesians, and then this letter to Timothy his final and most intimate letter where he pours his heart out to his friend Timothy. We don't know um, how long it's been 
between 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Uh, we know it's probably been a couple of years of freedom, and, and Paul now finds himself back in prison. And we know that since he wrote the letter 1 Timothy, things have changed quite dramatically for Paul. So things have gone quite bad. And so he writes this letter to Timothy saying, Timothy, I'm, I'm in prison in Rome. I'm in trouble. Um, I'm going through a trial. It's not looking good. I don't think I'm going to survive this. And the Lord speaks. <laughs> Is that thunder? Wowzers. That's never happened before. I know it wasn't the Lord, but I'm going to pretend because it gives me great confidence. Um, and, so, and so, wait, where am I? Anyway, Lord, shh, try to concentrate. <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway. And so, um, and so he says to Timothy, Timothy, I need you to come and be with me because I have to share with you. I have to tell you all the things you're going to need to do. I need to pass on to you this mandate and this mission that I have of sharing the gospel. I need to share that with you. I need to, to hand over my leadership. And I also want to encourage you and I want to I remind you about what's important. And one of the key themes that we see in that letter uh, to Timothy, 2 Timothy, is Paul encouraging, Paul encouraging um, Timothy to not be ashamed, just to put, put aside the shame. And, and, he, and that's important because, as I said, there was shame attached to his association with Paul. Um, people were deserting Paul because they were like, they were doubting his calling as an apostle. How can this guy keep being, keeps getting thrown in, in prison? How can that be the work of the Lord? Um, he, was, he was, a lot of his followers had sort of um, deserted him. And so I'm really struggling to concentrate with the thunder. <laughs> it's so bizarre. Oh, my word, focus, focus. And this thing that's bothering me. Anyway. So, so there's this negative association that's attached to, to, to Paul, and Timothy's saying, just forget it. Forget what people are saying. Everyone's going to have opinions. Everyone's going to have something to say. You, you have to not be ashamed of your association with me. We're, we're doing good work here. We're doing the work of the gospel. Not everyone's going to get it, and that's okay. We're going to keep doing it. And you don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of Jesus and his work and his ministry. Come and see me so that we can work that through together. Um, and he, he also has to remind Timothy, and we see another theme in the book of 2 Timothy, of Jesus' great power that's demonstrated through his resurrection, or his crucifixion and his resurrection. And it's really important that he, he encourages Timothy in the power of Jesus, saying, you know, you're not going to have to do this alone, um, because it was going to be rough. And there was a risk. It was a massive risk. He's asking Timothy to do something that has high levels of risk for the purpose of the gospel. And so he, he says, you know, God's power is going to, to be enough for you. And you're going to need it because being a follower of Jesus is not easy. It's not easy to be a follower of Jesus. And he was right. It wasn't easy for Paul. It wasn't easy for Timothy. Both of them lost their lives for the sake of the gospel. And it's not easy for us today either but for very different reasons. You know, we don't suffer persecution for our faith. There are many churches, or many Christians in the world today that suffer for their faith. There is a, a persecuted church. Australia is not one of those. We have a freedom to meet, to pray, to read the Bible. Sometimes we feel like we're being persecuted. We're not. We're just unpopular sometimes. It's not persecution. We have a great freedom. It is actually in many ways easy to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus. But that sometimes, that easiness can mean it's not easy because with an easiness, with a familiarity, can come a real complacency and an apathy. And we can and sometimes are really lazy and apathetic and complacent about this gospel. Think about this gospel. The awe and the wonder and the magnificence of a gospel that 
the living like Jesus and loving like Jesus and loving on the margins and loving in such a way that literally will change the world. The gospel will change the world. That's what Jesus came to do. And, and Paul carried on that work and Timothy carried on that work and others. And now it sits with us. Now we have it. We are the carriers. We are the heralds of the gospel. So what does it look like for us? Complacency is such a challenge. Years ago, and I think I've shared this before, I think in 2011 I did a, a tour around the US, the UK, and China as part of my master's degree in theology. And the subject was international, uh, contemporary ministry and international perspective, which really is just looking at different church ministries, faith-based organizations in the context across the world and understanding what makes them effective and, and what we can learn from that. Um, and it was amazing in the US and then we went to the UK and it was all great and then a highlight was going to China and meeting with the underground church. And so we met with a small group um, of workers in the underground church network, cell network, and we met in a karaoke bar a couple of times, where we would go in, we'd hire a karaoke room, we'd lock the doors, we'd put the music on really loud, and we'd sit and we'd talk about the things of God. And it was so cool, it was surreal. And we met this woman who was one of the key leaders at the time, and she, um, she didn't even tell us her real name, That's, she had been in, uh, imprisoned many times. And so she didn't even tell us her real name, and she was telling us about the incredible things that were happening, and how things were shifting and changing, and people were coming to faith, and they were seeing healings. Just that week, there was a guy with a goiter, you know, growth on his, on his thyroid, and they prayed for him, and, and it literally disappeared before their eyes. Like, that's the story she was telling us. Um, but the persecution was real and intense. And so we said to her as we were leaving, well, what can we pray for you about? Like, what can, how, when we go, how can we keep praying for you? And she said, oh, our biggest challenge is complacency. And I was like, no, I don't think it is. I don't think your biggest challenge is complacency. I think there are other people trying to kill you. That's probably it. She had handwritten the Bible five times to share it because they didn't have access to it. They had edited versions. She hand wrote it five times. How many of us have even read it five times? Complacency is their greatest challenge. And I was so struck by that because she said, you know, complacency creeps in. People, people lose their fervor, they lose their awe, their wonder, their passion for the gospel. And I was like, oh, that's what's going on. <laughs> we are very complacent with this powerful gospel that we, we all hold. And as I shared earlier this year, we're, we're, we're also in the West not particularly big fans of suffering. You know what I mean? We don't really like it. Eek, don't want to be uncomfortable. We like to be comfortable. We don't like suffering, and, and we really like everything to feel good all of the time, and when it starts to feel not so good, we don't like it. So we step out of it, or step over it, or step around it, because discomfort is uncomfortable, and we don't like it. But we have this precious gospel. So how do we? How do we, how do we become carriers of a gospel that are prepared to be a little uncomfortable? who are prepared to endure a little suffering, who are not complacent. Well, Paul gives Timothy some ideas. So we're going to read a passage from 2 Timothy. I know some of you thought, is she ever going to read the Bible? Yes, I am. <laughs> now, I'm going to read it now. 2 Timothy, um, and I think I told the guys chapter 2, verse 1, but I'm actually going to go straight to chapter three, verse 3. So 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 3, and it says this. This is what Paul is saying to Timothy. Join me in suffering like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similar, similarly, it's a difficult word to say, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive a victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of props. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. So Paul likens following to Jesus to having three mindsets, two, three ways of doing, three ways of being. 
that of a soldier, that of an athlete, and that as a farmer. So think about for a second, what are the things that come to mind when you think about those three categories of humans? Athletes, soldiers, farmers, what do you think? It's not rhetorical, you can answer. Dedicated, dedicated, hard work, discipline. Dedicated, hard work, disciplined. Our favorite words. <laughs> what else? Patient, perseverance, seasonal. Thank you, Cheryl, for that. What, what? Obedient, yeah. Hardworking, committed, determined, prepared to do what it takes. A soldier and a farmer and an athlete are deeply, deeply committed. They are all in for something that is bigger than themselves. They give themselves to it completely. It's not a part-time gig. They are in fully. And they are prepared to count the cost. They recognize sometimes they're going to have to do things they don't feel like doing. You see? <laughs> the Lord agrees. Sometimes they're going to have to get out of bed when they don't want to get out of bed. Sometimes they're going to have to inconvenience themselves. There's going to be a cost associated to it. How do we feel about that? How do we feel about what it means for us to be carriers and sharers of the gospel? Are we committed? Are we all in for this thing that is so much bigger than ourselves? Are we prepared to count the cost and do what's difficult sometimes and what's hard? I'm not talking about strife. I'm talking about commitment and dedication and maybe being a little uncomfortable and not being complacent. It's a real challenge. And if we look even to some of the nuances of the context that Paul exists in, you know, um, when, a, when a soldier, particularly around being a soldier, when a soldier in, in our context um, wants to sign, when someone wants to sign up to, to go into service, they'll, they'll apply, they'll do heaps of training, they'll do heaps of testing. Uh, if they're successful, they'll be selected, they'll be trained, they'll be assigned to a unit or a squadron and they'll be assigned to a commanding officer. In, in the time of Paul, it was quite different. They would be recruited. Commanding officers would, would call people out and say, you, you with me, and you come with me. There was a, a calling to themselves, a I am yours and you are mine, and we're gonna work together to accomplish something. And it's gonna be difficult, but we're in it together. It sounds a little bit like Jesus, right? calling disciples to himself, saying, I am yours and you are mine, and we're going to do this together. We're going to see the world changed. We're going to see his kingdom come together. Um, with, a, with a, what's the other guy, the athlete, Paul loved his athletics analogies. He'd often talk about field and track. And in this instance, he says, which I think is a little bit, hypocritical, really. He says, follow the rules to the athlete. And I'm like, mate, mate, you're in jail <laughs> for causing trouble all the time. I don't think you should be preaching about following the rules. But he's not talking about those sorts of rules. He's saying, as an athlete, you know what needs to be done. You know what you need to do to accomplish the task. There is a task, and you have to do what it takes to achieve the task. So be like an athlete. We know what needs to be done. We know what we need to be doing in our workplaces and in our worlds to share and live the gospel. And then finally, the farmer. Do we have any farmers here? Hardworking farmers? Does anybody know a farmer? Does anybody know a lazy farmer? No, they don't exist. They are hardworking. They are up at dawn, going all day, working hard. They, they, just as Paul says, they benefit from the crop and they have enough for themselves and they have enough for others because of the work of their hands and the way they toil. Um, if anybody's ever read the book Good to Great by Jim Collins, it's like a, 
you know, leadership textbook. Um, and in it, there's this amazing story about, and it's all about, you know, building big businesses and, and good businesses that last. And he talks about um, this organization, this, this company that was built to last. And what it wanted to do was to open up a whole lot of new steel factories. And so they decided that they were going to start their steel factories in agricultural areas where farming was really struggling so that the farmers could learn how to do steel work. And his philosophy was you can teach steel work to a farmer, but you cannot teach a farm work ethic to anybody else. If you want stuff to be done, if you want significant outcomes, you get farmers to do the job because they're going to do the job. They will count the cost. And so I think that's just such a beautiful illustration for us as well. God wants us to get something done. And so to have that farm working ethic in the way in which we approach it. Um, Prison Network has this amazing supporter um, who is a farmer. And his, his mother uh, has passed and on her sort of her deathbed had a conversation with him. Um, she always was a very outward looking woman and she was... Um, a deep lover of Jesus, and he wasn't so sure about it all, and she said to him, you make sure you carry on and do good work. And in honor of his mother, he has um, cordoned off a, an area of you've got thousands and thousands of hectares, and he's made a section that whatever produce comes from that section, he will sell, and it will be money that goes to empowering women in honor of his mother. And so a section of his farm, we get the... the the income from that. Isn't that phenomenal? Isn't that life-changing? He works by himself. He's an older gentleman. He gets trades in every now and again. It is actually miraculous to see. He does not have a mobile phone. He does not have the internet. He has folders and folders, and he runs a, a billion-dollar business. It's like, it is a miracle, um, <laughs> without a doubt. And, um, yeah, and he's, he's just phenomenal, but he works on his own and all he can do, he says, is, is when he's in contact with people, be the love and light of Jesus and this is what it looks like for him to empower the gospel. He will, he's got this land and that's what it looks like to him and it will look different to all of us. Everyone has a way in which God is gonna call you to, to bring the gospel into your unis, into your schools, into your workplaces, wherever it may be. I shared this story about a year ago, I'll share it again very briefly, about the founder of Prison Network. She was an 18-year-old girl who desperately wanted to be a missionary. She wanted to share the love of Jesus, and she was told she wasn't smart enough. And so she went to Pentridge Prison, and she knocked on the door, when there was still a woman in Pentridge Prison, this is 80 years ago, and she knocked on the door and she said, can I come in and just talk to the ladies here? And the matron said, I think you're crazy, but come on in. And in she came, and she just was kind and loved and was genuine and treated these women with honor and respect and dignity. And when she left, the matron said to her, it feels different. Since you've been here, you should come next week. And she did. And for 80 years, we've been doing that. We've been going to show love and kindness of Jesus. It doesn't mean hitting people over the head with a Bible verse or posting them on your Facebook page. It's not sharing the gospel, but it's his life and his love that we can bring into the spaces and places that we go. And so what does it look like for you? Sit with it. Consider it. What does it look like as you look to the year ahead and you start planning and thinking, what does it look like for you to not be complacent, to be engaged and to be active and maybe even a little uncomfortable for the work of the gospel? Does it look like coming and helping with youth? You know, when we're all engaged, we don't have holes and gaps because we're all in. You know, the, the buckets for the food are flowing over for the community. Everybody is doing what they can, bringing what they have for the work of the gospel. What will you do? What will you bring? Um, I think to me, at the end of that verse, uh, Paul says this to Timothy, and this is the, what I'm gonna leave you with. Reflect on what I'm saying and the Lord will give you insight into all of this. So take some time this week to really pray and consider. Reflect on this. Read Timothy, 2 Timothy. Read and think and consider what your year ahead looks like 
and what God is calling you to do. Amen? Now, before I go, speaking about the year ahead, and I didn't plan it, but it just worked out so nicely, um, that last year when I was here, we talked about, uh, I shared a little bit about Prison Network and the work that we're doing, and that is what it looks like for me to be the light and love of Jesus um, in, in a context. And it, like I said, it's different for everybody. For me, this is what the gospel looks like, um, is living love and acceptance and not judgment in a place where not everybody wants to go and not everybody wants to be. And so one of the things we do at Prison Network, we work with uh, women in prison and post-release, and every year amongst all the different things is we provide them with a beautiful gift hamper um, that lets them know that they are... They may feel alone, but we are standing with them and we are for them and we love them and we have them in our thoughts and our prayers. And it's full of all beautiful things like hair, you know, hair products. And, and it is honestly a miracle that we get it in every year. Corrections, because we've been around for a long time, we've got a really high credibility. So corrections let us send in this incredible gift hamper with chocolates and Tim Tams. And for years, we would buy a reject shop calendar to put in because it's really important for the woman to have uh, something to help them mark time. Um, and it's a real, it's, a, it's hope for the woman. And, and, and practical as well. They put their appointments in and all of that sort of stuff. And then last year we thought, we have so many incredibly gifted artists amongst the women that we serve. So both post-release and um, in prison. And so they have worked together to put together this beautiful calendar. So all the artwork in here is done by women who are in prison or have been in prison. And then at the, we've got at the front, this is something that the woman will put up in their, uh, in their rooms, in their cells. It talks about what programs we've got and when they can come and see us. And also, they've got a whole lot of recipes at the back because some of the women love to cook. And so we put some, some favorites in there that can be useful to anybody. And so what we, what we do towards the end of the year, we did it last year and it was super successful and lots of people were very keen for us to do it again, is that we sell these calendars. If you would like to, to buy one for yourself or buy one for a gift, we'd love to be able to um, do that, we'll do it at the table at the back. Um, or you can donate the funds for a calendar so that we can put one in a woman's um, hamper. So we're doing about 400 hampers, so we need 400 of those. Um, Patty, my colleague, is with me today, so she'll be helping me at the back table. Uh, and if you have any questions, we will be standing around um, ready to, to have a chat. And I think then I am really finished now. <laughs>